Okay, uh, let's start. There's a lot of people already in. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, first event of this semester's in conversation series. I'm uh, Tian Yang Sun, uh, a third year student um, in the School of Architecture and today's student host. In conversation is a student organized format of discourse alternative to that of a lecture. By pairing faculties of the school into an interesting clash of ideas, we hope to generate discourse, uh, uh, discourses that, are, that resemble those happening inside a third floor lobby and corridors rather than those on journals and podiums. We also hope that this brings some more conviviality uh, during our physical separation in this unusual time. Today we have Brian uh, and Michael Young, both currently teaching at the School of Architecture, both have uh, award-winning offices uh, based in New York City, both having grown up in Southern California suburbia, both receive uh, the Young Architects Prize from Architectural League of New York, um, and both don't want me to talk for too long. So let me yield the floor to Brian and Michael. Uh, thanks, Tian Yang, and thanks for inviting us. It's great to be here, great to be part of this uh, conversation series. I mean, as you said, and in, in how we're taking it as well, is this is not a format for a formal lecture. And, and by the way, as we enter into year two of all being here together, uh, Zooming with each other all the time, um, we're hoping that this is a little bit looser, a little bit um, freer, more conversationally based and fun. Uh, I know that usually there's themes for these conversations and there's no real overall theme for this today other than the fact that we're brothers and we're both architects and we're both teaching at the Cooper Union. And because of that, we wanted it to be uh, a little bit different. We hope that it doesn't devolve into too much of a kind of a reverie of our childhood, but some of that's gonna happen. It's just unavoidable. Uh, the other thing is we don't want it to be a lecture about our practices. This is not a format for that. And so what we've decided to do is I put together 30 images, I sent them to Brian. Brian put together 30 images, he sent them to me. Um, he's selected 15 to talk about me and I've selected 15 to talk about him. And it's gonna kind of roll like that. So we're gonna have stuff from our childhood, stuff from our undergraduate and graduate education, um, stuff from current practices and kind of take it like that. Seems like it's a, a maybe hopefully a, a way to kind of reveal in a certain light this is a student run lecture series. And I think hopefully maybe at some level, it's interesting for you to, to kind of see a little bit of the ways in which threads and thoughts and experiences and environments have kind of carried over into the work we do now and throughout our life. Um, so Brian, um, you know, for lack of a further introduction in, in some ways, um, this is my brother, Brian Young. He was born in 1975 in uh, Marina del Rey, Los Angeles, California. I'm Michael Young. I was born in 1973 in Inglewood, California. We grew up in LA and uh, moved to Orange County in the early 80s. And a lot of our experiences in Southern California in the 1970s and 1980s experience in impacted and inflected what we do and how we think about the environment, how we think about architecture. I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo for undergrad then worked for an architect, Peter Found, San Francisco for six years and went to Princeton for graduate school and 15 years later or 15 years um, from now, started teaching at the Cooper Union. Um, Brian went to Berkeley, worked for a number of architects in San Francisco and New York, Allied Works, ARO, uh, went to the GSD for graduate school and started Young Projects um, 10 years ago, Brian? Almost 11. 11. And my own practice, uh, Young and Ayata, was started about 12 years ago. So I don't know if we need anything more than that. It's just kind of like basics. So do you want to share your screen, Brian, and go for it? Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you, Mike. And actually, before I start, thank you, Ting Yang, for organizing this. And of course, um, thank you to the Cooper Union and Dean Tarani. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to get to be involved with such an amazing school. Um, the students really are amazing. Um, and also, do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. And also, thank you to my brother, Mike Young. Um, 
certainly uh, my business partner, Noah Marciniak, has been an incredible influence on the architecture we produce at Young Projects. Um, but through years of conversations and dialogue, I, I'm sure that nobody has influenced the work that we do more than Mike, certainly from the perspective of uh, having an older brother who has consistently uh, helped me understand in maybe the simplest of terms at times, ways in which the work we're producing fits into a larger uh, contextual environment of philosophy and theory. Um, whether it is conscious or unconscious, one way or the other, the two of us, I think, have directed our careers in different paths in the sense that I'm likely first a practitioner, but I've taught for a dozen or so years and you're likely first um, an academic, although I think your practice is unbelievable. Um, and I guess just one other thing, Mike mentioned that this is gonna be pretty informal. Uh, we're gonna be showing images and places from California and influences from family and ideas about music. And I think we may have found um, in many cases uh, ideas that have stuck with us that we might have engaged when we were younger. In other situations, these may be forced connections, but I think that's okay for us and we wanna share that with you guys and in a way give you a window into our work that you might not otherwise have. Um, so with that, I give you Mike Young or Michael Young as the Cooper Union knows him. And this is an image of Mike in Cal Poly as he is I'm gonna get some of this wrong, but I'm gonna go for it. Completing his undergrad architectural thesis in which he built a full scale um, environment in his own studio space at the school. And I think if I'm correct, when it was reviewed by critics, he rolled himself in saran wrap, put a microphone up to a broken speaker and kind of rolled around on the ground. Um, and Regardless of what that was about, I can tell you one thing that was about spectacle and a, a kind of visual event. And I think that permeates into a lot of the architecture that Young and Ayata have created is this sense of a kind of graphic moment. Um, this is a photograph from the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History where our grandmother on our father's side was a docent for several decades and we spent countless days in this museum and she would take us into the archives and she would show us the different ways in which um, species and animals have been stored and maybe even more for me than for Michael um, I would say this idea of cataloging and collecting and organizing and then representing um, was kind of fundamental to uh, who I was as a kid and, and how I think about architecture and I can remember being uh, mesmerized by the ways in which different species are kind of encoded with certain graphics or certain geometries. These are the Slee stacks. And in some ways, this isn't a lecture, but if Mike uses this image to start his lectures, I think it's very appropriate. Um, Slee stacks were on a television show in the late 70s. And they, they, without a doubt, were the scariest things I can remember from my childhood. And they're uh, part reptilian, part humanoid, uh, intergalactic creatures. And in some ways, the fact that they are these kind of hybrid uh, species, I think is really relevant to Mike's work as he's creating hybrid architectures. But I think the more useful reference point for this image is really the kind of expression on the Slee Stack's faces. And I would say that this is kind of how Mike wants you to um, feel when you engage his architecture. It's a moment of awe, it's a moment of shock, it's a moment of confusion, but not necessarily fear. It's what's going on here. And I'm not quite sure what's going on here. And maybe this is a good transition to some of his work, um, starting with the still life and certainly Mike's interest in objects and the estranged object and speculative realism, but uh, lost in that conversation sometimes I think are really incredibly rich ideas about tectonics, ideas about coloration and pattern and texture. And in the end, what is so special about an image like this and what allows the object to oscillate between being 
both foreign and at the same time kind of at home within this context are these qualities of, of the surface and of its um, developing tectonics. And so it's with these eyes that you come upon this and then you come upon this. Um, and it's with this mentality that I think that the pods or, or the vessels of, of the Bauhaus project are beginning to engage in urban context. And I almost see these very similarly to those eggs that have been collected and that from the exterior, you can understand these as a series of quite different um, vessels that have come together to form a series of clusters. And they're specifically interested in this distinction between the various objects, but upon entering the internal court of this building, uh, that reading is completely flipped. And maybe this is a, a connection between uh, the work we do, which is a, a consistent interest in beginning to um, reverse the legibility or reverse the reading of a project. So here upon the internal court, the vessels are obviously articulated in a manner in which the graphic condition of the surface is meant to bleed from one vessel to the next vessel instead of defining a, a distinction and contrast. And so in pulling these together, I think that comes in part from coloring. And while we both would say we love Dungeons and Dragons, I think the reality is we probably only played Dungeons and Dragons a couple times, but we spent an insane amount of hours in coloring books with prisma colors, mixing colors, coloring in the lines, coloring out of the lines, finding ways in which to make an architectural figure ground relationships were beginning to emerge precisely because you couldn't quite understand where an edge might exist. And that was an idea about coloration. And this is a good segue to talk about geometry. So this is the science hall that is uh, underground. It was designed by the Eames that connected the Natural History Museum to the Science Museum, I think. Science um, and right, and, and so here you see uh, in the foreground, actually, let me get on my annotate. That would be good. This model and this kid who isn't Mike because he doesn't have a big Afro um, but it's a model that's articulating um, Dessar's theorem. And in Mike's own words, he's talked about that theorem more than anybody else. And it, it's an idea about projective geometry in which uh, a series of relationships over projected space begin to become contingent because of uh, a system. Um, and it, it's somewhere in here whether he saw this or not, that I think Mike's interest in geometry uh, was perked. I know for sure that after we finished undergrad and before Mike went to grad school, where he continued with his interest in geometry at Princeton, that my wife, who has a, a master's in mathematics, um, was getting rid of I don't know, 10 of her math books from finishing graduate school. And Mike said, hey, can I have all of those? And I think he read all 10 of those math books. And so this kind of intense interest in math and geometry, um, I think really merged with an idea of spectacle and graphic. And, and what's interesting to me is that uh, he's really doing it. You know, this idea of an edge um, I think of occlusion, the ability to perceive, uh, or he would say that the, the gain and loss of a boundary is fundamental to a, a kind of immediate understanding through decades of research into geometry. So in a drawing like this, which is a mapping of Bormini, uh, Sintivo, and in some ways, I think it first is a mediation to generate a notis notational system that allows you to read what's happening in the geometry of that uh, cathedral and within the dome that otherwise you might not be able to perceive. But next it becomes 
in a way, a diagram that's different than a notation, because it's a diagram that's put in place specifically with the intent of promoting new conditions. So as tangents and normals begin to describe geometry, a second iteration of tangents and normals on top of the notational system become an instrument to construct new geometries, which then became, I think for Mike with the um, addition of grasshopper and different computational methodologies, something in which the notational system in and of itself was an interesting architectural event. Um, in the construction of atmosphere, in his interest in discussing sensation, in the interest in uh, kind of optical phenomena. And that is where I think you can depart into um, one of their first projects. And again, this idea of gain and loss of an edge, which he might say is the project for Young and Ayata. Um, and it's really interesting when I look at this project and think about this idea of where the boundaries are and these apertures that have been pushed into the building. And what I enjoy so much about it is actually that, again, it kind of leads to a tectonic, a tectonic in the sense that the, the vertical striation of the board form concrete versus the horizontality of the slab are critical in terms of defining these rural surfaces going into the building. But then if you look at it long enough, you start to realize that maybe those tectonics or that hierarchy has emerged out of these transformative moments within the building, that it's not a series of windows being pushed in, but that it's a series of concrete planes being pulled out. And so it's this oscillation again that I find really fascinating in a lot of their work. And I especially love the image on the right, where just for a moment, you don't know how far these windows go. And they could keep going all the way in. And it's that kind of lack of uh, legibility or the creation of ambiguity through very thoughtful geometric uh, procedures and through tectonics that begin to create an incredible engagement with the architectural object. And then here's an interior of that project. And I, I mean, I still look at this, I don't know what's going on. Um, and it's in my mind, an idea about understanding relative geometry in a manner that has so skewed your ability to kind of perceive what's flat um, versus what's canting that it, it puts you kind of in a state of, of you know, momentary confusion. Um, I was looking at this and it reminded me, Mike, when I was getting ready to talk today of uh, the Knott's Berry Farm uh, Magic House house, if you remember that. So I looked it up and that house was actually called the house of strange phenomena. So I just wanted to let you know that that's what's going on in that house. Something improbable is happening. And um, I think he's after capturing the improbable or creating the improbable in many of his projects. And so here, this is a, this is a restaurant in LAX, and actually, I think I was born in Inglewood as well, but that's not really that relevant. Um, we were born right next to the LAX airport, and um, on our mother's side, our grandparents lived adjacent to LAX, and I can remember with my grandfather often going and parking the car and watching the planes take, take off, and going to this restaurant on many occasions, and, and this being the kind of first strange building that we ever interacted with. Um, and actually looking at it, I think there's elements of the Busain Opera House happening in this building. Um, but it was also, I think it's interesting to Mike's work that the building is something you look at, but then you go inside and you look out and that's what happens in this building. And when you look out, what you see is the freeway. And when you see the freeway, um, I think that is a, kind of fundamental to our upbringing, this idea of being in the car, this idea of engaging suburbia, this idea of engaging Los Angeles. So uh, this is Mike Watt um, uh, from the Minutemen, somebody who from a punk rock perspective was hugely influential on uh, our interest in music, but also I would say our interest in engaging a creative process. 
And well, thanks. That, that would be great. Um, all right. So now I'm going to, do you want to unshare and then I'll share? Yes, I'll do that. So we're back at the young, young. Everybody's seen it, Brian? Yeah. I'm seeing it. All right, cool. All right, so uh, Los Angeles and the freeway and um, punk rock and music. And I don't want to belabor this point too much, but I think it's important for both Brian and I. So here's an image of Fugazi, the band from Washington, D.C. at the Hollywood Palladium in 1990. Um, there's an important thing that happens. Uh, every generation at a certain level, I think, believes that they're in the moment of transition where everything is that's going to become important for culture in the future happens. Um, and, and we're not going to make any sort of large claims on that for our generations, but uh, for whatever reason, the, the, the music that came at the end of the 80s right into uh, the transition to 1990, which now for some reason or another people will call post-punk, or people will call the emergence of alternative music or the people who describe in um, other manners for what it began to do in the 1990s was crucial for us. Uh, 1989, it turned 16 and we start to drive to Hollywood, Brian and I, and we start to see shows uh, as often and as frequently as we can. And I can tell you without a doubt that the 1990s Sonic Youth at the Whiskey A Go Go changed my life. I'd never seen or heard anything that loud, that noisy or that, um, sort of uh, um, confrontational in terms of its oral aesthetics in my life. And this also links into shows with uh, Fugazi or Nirvana opening up for Dinosaur Jr. or um, the Pixies opening up for Jane's Addiction. This was the world in which we, we began to kind of transition from being children to being adults. And it went part and parcel with the whole culture. Here's Brian uh, catching air out of levels in 1987. Uh, there's a couple of reasons I'm showing this. First of all, skateboarding was huge for us. Uh, Brian was also a much better skateboarder than I was. There's, there's something to be said and it's, um, I think that the, at some moment people begin to realize that they're being as influenced by those who are younger than them as those who are older than them. And uh, I think for me that happened very early on in, in my childhood when I realized that Brian was influencing me, pressuring me to uh, change and to grow and to think about things that I was doing in my life. And, and that was because he was often quite uh, a bit better than me at almost everything. And I actually would include uh, architecture to tell you the truth. So, but there's another reason why I'm showing you this. We grew up in this kind of fringe edge interface between a growing suburbia in Southern California and the start of the high desert. Uh, this for us was kind of nature. Um, both Brian and I think are afraid of forests. We didn't spend a lot of time camping or going into uh, densely wooded areas. And so there's something still about a, a lot of trees that is kind of off-putting and a little scary. But deserts are all right. Deserts are kind of uh, weird in terms of what they present as a sort of navigatable, navigatable wilderness terrain. And one of the things about the environment that we grew up in and its relationship to nature was there's always these things, infrastructure water infrastructure, culverts, drainage ditches, um, some sort of hunk or chunk of concrete or piece of lost industry that was abandoned and decrepit and lying there within um, the environment. And I think that's kind of always conditioned in a certain way the, uh, our understanding of a relationship between the natural and the artificial and the infrastructural. And of course, when you come into these things, you have a skateboard and you use them in a, a different way than uh, the water would, or maybe other people would. And I think that relationship to the environment uh, as a kind of mediation through something like a skateboard has been with us throughout our entire life in Hawaii. Uh, back. And, uh, yeah. You have to say that this is called levels because oh, yeah. there's an incline, a flat bottom, and then another incline up, which is, you know, it's sectional condition that we would pull these plywood pieces so that we can negotiate being on dirt to get into the concrete but there were three levels so this inclined section in and of itself is then inclined to take you from the top level down to the next level and only people who really shred could go from level one to level two to level three level one to level two to level three that's a good segue man you're just like setting it up left and right uh 
So one of the other mediations in which everybody at a certain level in the 1980s was involved with was video games. Uh, so this is Brian's graduate thesis at the GSD um, in 2003. And I wanna explain just how kind of amazing I think this project is. So what Brian was doing is he was taking these environments, uh, specifically Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, that we'd grown up with and spent hours and hours of our uh, childhood playing. And he started to take them seriously. So if Pac, well, I'm gonna go back. If Pac-Man can go out the left here and come in the right here, that means that Pac-Man lives in a cylinder. Yeah, straight up, that, that makes sense. If I go out the left and come in on the right, I live in a cylinder. And so Brian started to just play each of those rules, each of those sorts of uh, situations that exist within the video game environment and try to find their spatial or architectural or formal implications. So Pac-Man lives in a cylinder, uh, makes a model of the maze, the labyrinth in a cylinder, wraps it three-dimensionally around. And what you're looking at in the model on the right is a kind of oblique section cut through that cylindrical model of Pac-Man. There's also all these other rules that he begins to identify. If the ghost's eyes are looking the other way, you can move under the ghost, and that means that actually there has to be multiple layers. So now the maze gets multiple levels, multiple layers, and they kind of intertwine with each other and um, further complexify the spatial situation of Pac-Man. He also did things like look at Donkey Kong, where if uh, the if the Gorilla can throw, Donkey Kong can throw a barrel down through the, through the levels, through the ramps. It means that there's a hole. It means that the ramps aren't actually stacked on top of each other, but they actually have to shift or stagger from uh, plane to plane. A lot of what Brian's identifying here are a set of rules, a set of systematic rules that have absurdities to them. So that when one begins to play the game, you're not only just interacting with a character and an environment and scores that you're trying to beat and levels that you're trying to reach in terms of your own um, sort of uh, skill in the video game environment. You're also a participant in a series of absurd rules. And you're going to play that out as a character once you know and how to, how to navigate them and how to understand them and occupy that virtual video game environment uh, as a kind of projection of your own inhabitation. And I can see this in his architecture, the architecture of young projects. Uh, there's many instances, I'm just showing one here. This is the, the guest house down at Playa Grande in, in the Dominican Republic. But within it, there's a series of formal rules, a series of formal operations, a series of systematic decisions, yet they're played um, until they run against a glitch or an absurdity or an impossibility. And that then becomes its formal spatial and in this case also its material articulation of color and tiles and patterns on its, uh, on its facades and on its edge. And that in and of itself begins to become an architectural expression. Uh, you set up a series of rules, you play the game and you find out when and where and how those rules begin to produce effects that you could not predict in excess of the system you're operating within. Another thing that Brian and I did throughout our childhood was we built a lot of forts. And the weird thing is we probably built most of our forts inside and we probably built most of our forts with sheets and or blankets hung on strings to create a kind of draped uh, cavern-like world of interiority. And this sort of expression, this sort of draped surface is in a number of projects that both Brian and I um, have developed throughout our careers. For one, just as an example, the six square house that Brian and uh, his office completed just last year has this sort of incredible billowing roof, uh, a roof that to me is, is reminiscent of the, the world of draped fabric of draped sheets throughout strings that kind of billow down and connect these spaces in their ceiling. Now, in relationship to the video game and its glitches of systematic rules, this, this sort of surface that combines and fuses everything together on the interior from the exterior is essentially a, um, six squares, six squares with gabled roofs that have been rotated against each other that touch at the corners and begin to play. You begin to, we don't have the plan here, which you, you can probably see and um, understand a little bit from the massing that we're seeing in this photograph. And that has a tie back to those kinds of systematic games of play uh, where rules are put in place and chance operations begin to have an effect on the expression of the architecture. 
another contact and, and it's uh, important just to stress how, you know, in a, in a weird sort of way, influential the Museum of Natural History was on us. We spent a lot of time there as Brian has, has already said, but uh, one room in, per in particular importance was the Hall of Minerals and this relationship to uh, crystals, to geologies, to geometry, not just in its abstraction and purity of uh, mathematical expressions, but also to the ways in which it happened and happens through material processes, processes that involve chemical reactions, physical reactions, reactions of, of thermal relationships, and just the kind of insane beauty and unpredictable spontaneity that sometimes these crystals would have. There's also this question of the vitrine or the portal to another world that's somehow in the display case. Brian was referencing this earlier with the archive he showed from the Museum of Natural History. I think you can see something like that in this loft that Young Projects did in Tribeca. The outside, a garden, is dropped into the inside through the roof as a kind of portal to another world, a vitrine, in a way uh, that's capturing a kind of slice of nature that is an artificially nature, an artificial nature that has been jacked into the house, but the house then surrounding it and relating to it from every different uh, aspect of its public spaces and making it accessible as part of the daily life of living in the city in this case. Or strange symmetries. I think this is another thing that, that both of our architectures are interested in. Symmetries which are not pure, symmetries which have somehow been disturbed Symmetries, which are sometimes local, sometimes global, sometimes legible, sometimes more within the, the questions of a kind of vibration or movement, like Hans Jenny's uh, cymatic uh, sonic vibrations. And that kind of symmetry here, and also the sort of collect collection or the vessels that have uh, been collected now, these are all roof designs that Brian has done for a project. But the way in which they're displayed is not to display them as a, a, a typological architectural element that is then deployed within a building, but to say that their typology, that their development, that their, their reality is actually another sort of investigation, an investigation into speciation, an investigation into uh, geometry in relationship to articulations of patterns, of colors, of textures, of natures, and to, uh, to display them here in a vitrine with labels uh, almost as if they are pinned butterflies in a shadow box is kind of an incredibly strange and provocative way in which to say, I like roofs, right? Because these are all roofs. It's the roof to the project you just finished recently, the main house at Playa Grande in the Dominican Republic, which is an insane project, it just should be said. It's um, uh, beautiful in its complexity and its resolution on almost every level you can think of architecturally. And also, I think importantly, you can skate it, not literally, <laughs> but you can skate it in your mind. And I think there's something to this here with a, with a lot of our products and, and uh, this roof, um, especially, they are built out of a certain kind of movement of surfaces, ruled surfaces, uh, surfaces that have both curvatures and cusps, edges that uh, bleed into each other and combine and fuse different uh, planes. And that is the world of the skateboarder at a certain level. This was the image we decided to choose uh, to put on the poster for the, the, the conversation today. And it's from um, the Upland Pipeline. If you don't know the Upland Pipeline, this is it rebuilt by Vans a few years ago. But when we were kids, we would go to the city of Upland and we would go to the pipeline. And there's a great story of going here the day after Christmas where our uh, mother fought with the owner of the Upland Pipeline to get us uh, uh, passes to come in there because every kid in Southern California had a new skateboard that day um, was there to skate the pools. Um, but I pointed out for another reason too, a uh, particular reason is that pool that's in the middle. It's called the Combi Pool. And that pool has an insane amount of uh, effect, I think, on both Brian and I, from geometry to curvature to the combination of uh, relationships, gaps, edges, edges that disappear, edges that reappear. And it also was something I think we were uh, just eternally afraid of because that's where all the best skateboarders were uh, operating at the time. We were, we were mainly skateboarding in the pools to the top of that, the kind of other shallow kidney pools. But uh, there was a few times when we went out and, and tried our luck at the combi pool and, and uh, not with great success, but 
still with great impact on our lives. I don't know, Brian, did you want to pick up something here too? I mean, it's a, it's a figure that um, I think is relevant to our work, but I think maybe more your work right now, although the six square house, I think deals with this as well, but this strange pool that merges a square or rectangle and a circle together and the kind of resultant geometries that come out of that. Um, and we, I wanted to show this um, because we had the combi pool um, as part of the poster for the introduction. So, but to see the combi pool in context, you have, this was called the snake which ended up in this huge bowl. And then there's a series of kind of much more gentle pools on one side. Then there was the full pipe. Um, I did that one time and I ate it. And then this kind of landscape. Um, and really, I bet we only went to Upland two or three times. Uh, but it's always been like a kind of profound environment that stuck with me. And in looking at this, and then looking at Young and Ayata's site plan for, um, you'll have to, oh yeah, that, there it is. Um, this concert hall, like I, I cannot help but think about the way in which uh, hybrid geometries and circles and rectangles have sprawled across this landscape and not think about upland. Um, and again, this is maybe one of those forced connections that I'm talking about, but what I don't think is forced is the idea that in the next figure, or the next image, um, this interest in the figure, and maybe that's something that we haven't talked a lot about in Mike's work, and I think maybe it's something that's resonating with more recent projects, um, but the figure even maybe more specifically as something that is the resultant of a combination of geometries. This idea of the gain and loss of an edge is still in there as one edge condition begins to transform or through a series of ruled surfaces um, allows for a sense of ambiguity. But at the same time, this is a project in which I think quite clearly there is an interest in um, speaking to the figure relative to a whole. Yeah, figuration made uh, here also through cut, that the cut is, a, is an intrusion of abstraction into whatever material mass formal condition exists behind it. Um, yeah, uh, and this is our last slide. Uh, and, and Brian, you chose it. And I think the reason you chose it is kind of great. Do you want, do you want to just describe why you chose this image? You have a lot, a lot to talk about with this one, also with the Slee Stacks. Um, so there's Ray and Egon, who are fundamentally just floored by this uh, symmetrical book stacking in Ghostbusters because it is in their mind extremely alien and that it you know it's a representation of of some act that is is not humanistic and Bill Murray is looking at it like what the what what are you guys talking about no and I think he says in the movie something like no human would ever stack books like this and so you know on one level it is a little bit of like an observation about whether it's triple o or you know, other ways in which I think that within the work we self, within the work itself, we can um, you know, find these qualities that are quite significant and profound in terms of how they allow us to author a certain relationship. And yet at the same time, when you step back, um, you wonder like, well, this is just a set of stacked books. This isn't quite that much. But this morning I looked it up in Tobin's spirit guide. And if you don't know about Tobin and his spirit guide, it's all made up. But Tobin says of this, in certain areas of high psychokinetic activity, I've seen peculiar things happen to small objects, especially flat ones. Mike likes flat ones like lines. In addition to the almost commonplace levitation and hurling about of objects with occasionally end up in perfectly symmetrical stacks, ranging anywhere from a few to a dozen feet in height. I've measured several of these stacks over the course of my studies and they all exhibit perfect mathematical symmetry beyond the capabilities of normal human beings. And if that's not in part, um, I think some of the architecture that 
is inspiring to you and what you're trying to create, I don't know what is. I think I think it's a great place to stop, Brian. Super super funny. Um, so, uh, Ting Yang, I, look, we we kind of wanted to do this, uh, talk about each other's work, and 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 do it in a kind of brief manner that we've just done. So, uh, Brian and I have things we could probably just keep rolling with and say to each other about what we've shared and what we've shown. But um, also, uh, we'd like to open it up to you and and maybe. Anybody else that wants to ask us things about uh, about what we're talking about in, in our um, whatever our, our upbringing and in our kind of work as architects? And maybe Go also ahead. just one thing really quickly. While we've showing while we've shown um, moments, locations, places, images, music that were inspiring to us, we we did make a point um, that I think is relevant to both of us to show work that we did when we are in school that still is connected to the work we're doing 20 years later as practitioners and teachers. And uh, we wanted to share that with the students at Cooper Union, um, you know, to put in place an idea that as you do your thesis project, that's gonna be something that you carry with you and develop into your own practices. Yeah. And, and not to put too much pressure on the thesis students that are operating with uh, five weeks or so to go uh, right now, but neither Brian, Brian nor I said when we were doing a thesis, ha, huh, yes, this is great. I'm going to work on this for another 20 years. That don't work that way. Um, what happens is just quite often you're working on a set of ideas and then you graduate, you work into some other situation, whatever office or your own work may be, and you find those ideas recurring. So it, it happens much more naturally. It's not something that you you force upon your your life as an architect. It's actually kind of in a way in you. However, it got in you, and you develop it um, over the course of a life. So maybe uh, Tin Yang, did did you have some thoughts or things you wanted to throw our way? Yeah. Uh, normally, this should be me asking questions, but I think uh, considering what you just did. My question will be the boring devil's advocate kind of uh, uh, questions compared to what many of our audience will uh, come up with. We'll probably leave uh, 30 to 40 minutes uh, before to, to, to the audience and floors because we have a lot of people uh, depending on how many. But um, I think I first meet Michael in my first year, first semester review. He says something about me pouring plaster and the grains of it. I, I didn't understand back then. I didn't know what you said. And then <laughs> I checked your work recently and I see the, the first built work. And I was like, oh, that's, I, I get that now <laughs> perhaps. So there's this a strange connection between, again, like um, uh, my past as an early student and you. Um, Brian taught me in second year and it was a fascinating semester about play. I don't know, did you come up with the idea? Because uh, I knew you had that GST. Uh, L Lorena. Uh, Lorena? Yeah. Okay, but I think it fits a lot of your bills. It, it's a good one. But, you know, first I I didn't think you're you were related before I heard the rumors. It was like, because Michael seemed to be someone that's from, you know, at least for me first year, it was like somebody from Greek mythology. And then you just see, <laughs> that's a good description. <laughs> and um, but I think you have a lot in common in terms of practice. Um, I, I think my first question is that um, I think Michael, you mentioned in one of those interviews that I I don't know where I see it is that you you have different one thing with your partner uh, Ku Tang uh, that is you want a Peter Eisman office and he wants a Ku Ha's office. Mm. Does that still exist? And you know what, what side would you take? Right. Well, yeah, to just uh, to explicate that, that, that came from an interview for the, the student journal at Pratt, where there was a series of questions asked to Kutan. Kutan Ayata is my partner at Young and Ayata. Uh, and I think it's maybe indicative of something that, that speaks to partnerships in architecture. I think Brian would, would maybe agree with this or not, but I think it's when one goes into practice and starts to develop an architectural studio, I think having a partner, having a colleague, having somebody you're working with is crucial. 
Um, I think it's just it's super important to have one that you're somebody you're talking with uh, in a kind of long um, array uh, of ideas over time. And uh, for Kutan and I, we shared a lot of similarities, a lot of uh, common interests and common concerns. But there came this question in the interview of, uh, would you go um, the line of Peter Eisenman or would you go the line of Ren Koolhaas? I myself, I, I said and, and still believe and would choose Peter Eisenman and uh, uh, Kutan chose Ren Koolhaas. And I think actually that kind of difference Enough similarities, but then differences of opinion on specific aspects of architecture uh, is important, and 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 that's where that kind of question came from. I don't know if Brian has has a, a decision on, on that or, or not. Uh, I started my practice um, independently, and uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and I do have a partner now, I mentioned at the start, Noah Marciniak and Mallory Schur, who is a third partner. And, you know, in my mind, it's very different from maybe Mike and Kutan in the sense that uh, I, Mike and Kutan, while they might have different interests and work um, in a different manner, I think they are pretty united in how they fuel the work of the office. And um, in young projects, I think the partners maybe play different roles. And part of that, I think, is the uh, dedication to, um, to building, to making material prototypes, to think about craft and detail and tectonics, and realizing that there's a, a, a really critical skill set that Noah, for example, brings to the table that has allowed a lot of our projects to be built. Um, as for Peter Eisenman or Rim Kohlhaas, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That's not a kind of question that I understand. So <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Is there I mean, something like or Colin or Bean? You got to choose one. Like, it's like, you're not going to play that role. Um, uh, they're both like hugely influence, influential architects. Um, the way I understand Peter is through the uh, lens of Mike, as he has many times explained to me um, what's happening. You know, I remember, j just for example, I went to the GSD before Mike went to Princeton and I still would either call Mike, actually I remember a Laker game. We went to a Laker game and I said, hey Mike, I, I have Michael Hayes and we're talking about Peter Eisenman. Can, can you help me here? And Mike laid out exactly what I needed to hear. So. Um, you know, they're both fundamentally like, you know, icons of modernism and, and have helped me tremendously with the work, but I can't, I don't like align myself with either of them. Yeah, that's always the answer. <laughs> that's always a trick question. Uh, I think if we um, move on a bit, I think uh, a personal observation of your work is that uh, there's a, it's, it's an interesting there's an interesting sense of detachment from buildings and architecture on one hand, but also a lens of, of an architect's gaze upon a lot of things you see, right? If you change uh, a set of presenters and uh, maybe give them the same prompt, um, they wouldn't be able to link uh, those images that come from different cultural sources onto your, your architectural mindset somehow. And I think that that idea of both detaching and attaching in the same way is interesting uh, and is productive in some way. But I do have a question is that none of you uh, talked about the aspects of inhabitation beyond perception, beyond the sensual, beyond what it is to look from inside out or what it is to look from the street into it from either elevational view or, or something like that. So the things that are not easily captured by images. What do you feel about that? It's a very big question, however you want to answer. Maybe I take this to literally, um, and in a lecture uh, that is more specifically on our work and not on our relationship, I certainly would speak very much to um, one's reading of an architectural proposition as you come upon it, one's shifting reading as you move around it, the, again, in many cases, the kind of inversion of your understanding of the spatial proposition upon entering it. And then in 
in almost every building we've completed. So 10, 11, 12, going inside and having a kind of unexpected uh, courtyard prism, uh, a moment in which there is a new world, this like, kind of idea of a vitrine that is this, this artificial, uh, artificial landscape almost that you're visualizing. So I don't know if it's a question of the fact that we're very loosely touching on these projects, but certainly the, the transformative narrative that takes place as you move through Young Projects buildings is often one in which uh, the narrative shifts. And then also, and also how you look back out. If you take the six square house, on the one hand, it is extremely internally driven by a series of geometric consequences as we're looking at corresponding geometric relationships and manipulating them in space to construct something that is an object. But at the same time, while that's internally motivated, when you come upon that building and go inside through its siding and through developing, developing the landscape around it, you really begin to engage in exterior contexts such that this building through its um, overriding symmetry actually feels as if it's grounded within its landscape because of how you look out to it from the interior of the building. Yeah, I, I would think, um... Jin Yang, it's a, it's a good question and it's a, a astute observation. There is, um, I think within both Brian and my uh, practice, both Young Projects and Young and Ayata, uh, there, there is a privileging of the visual. And, and, uh, and I think that's, that's accurate to say, but it's, I don't see it as being at the full expense of other modes of experience. And, and Brian is an incredible, um, uh, emphasis and interest in materiality and the ways in which materials can can be used to articulate the architecture. Uh, Young and Ayata, the, the building we did in Mexico, um, were as interested in the transition between the inside and the outside, what would be formerly known as the poche, that the interior surface or the interior spatial idea is not completely uh, concurrent indoor related to an exact offset from the exter external um, form or the external mass. And so it's, it's more than purely visual, but uh, yeah, there, there are aspects in which at a certain level, our, our engagement with architecture is at least initially through sight and through vision and through questions of disturbing sight and vision. And, and maybe if you wanted to extend it further, uh, the attributes that one begins to bring to um, the world that, that come in, at least initially through sight. Uh, does it feel heavy? Does it feel cold? Does it feel soft? Does it feel uh, uh, thin? Does it feel thick? All of those things which are tactile and haptic, um, but at least initially triggered or problematized through vision in a lot of the architecture we've done. And, and again, it's not a lecture about each of these practices and their specific architectures, because we really wanted to get into it, we could probably find, suss out some important differences between the way we work, Brian and myself. Um, but uh, there is that thing you've identified, Tim. It's true. I think for proceeding from that, uh, I think someone in the chat has asked you about, uh, I, I would encourage people to speak. I guess even fine to, let's say, interrupt questions. Uh, uh, but I think if someone already typed in the chat, it's, it's a simple question of uh, why do you choose Princeton? And for me, I want that question to be a bit more loaded than why a school and your time at there is, you know, after you, you, what, what has graduate education done to you guys? Or have you, you know, what, what did you do to them? Because there is a, what I observed from your common interest is it might be from let's say, is, is it an East Coast thing? Is it a Californian thing? Is it a 90s thing? Uh, not sure, but the, the attention to surface, to texture, to the visuals, to the central, to, to the color, a lot of ideas that are con, kind of excluded from the ontology of, of pedagogy that we have, uh, we had at least, I think it's, I'm criticizing my own school, but I think Cooper's was not very interested in those things. So um, 
you know, what happened in your education? It's like a very vague question, again, especially graduate school. Well, there's, yeah, there's a number of questions in that question, which is, well, maybe we'll sort them out bit by bit. But um, uh, it took me six years to do a five-year Bachelor of Architecture degree at Cal Poly and then worked for an architect for six years. So 12 years into this situation, I realized, oh man, um, what I really miss is uh, the discussion, the discourse, the the academic side of um, architecture. Uh, we should state this, both our mother and father are teachers. Brian and I were raised by educators and, and the value and importance of education and uh, life was, was kind of ingrained in us in a very early age. And so I went to graduate school because I wanted to get into teaching. Uh, just as, as straight as that. Um, and Brian, you might have a slightly different answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I took the question a little bit differently. Um, what happened for me, at least, it made me go to Pac-Man or Donkey Kong. Um, I had Hashem Sarkis, who I'm still close to as my thesis advisor. And um, this project was very much a response to his engagement in uh, the subject and the object and, and uh, kind of instrumentalizing the diagram. And it occurred in 2002, 2003. And for some people, if they remember the, the I-beam competition, and it, it occurred in a moment in which diagrams were being extruded. And so diagrams were being literalized as a building. And we wanted to offer a kind of alternative to that. And I think Stan Allen talks a lot about this in um, one of the uh, any issues from back then that the diagram should be something that promotes a different condition. So for me, um, and, and this probably is a, one of the most significant difference, differences between how Mike and I work, um, a lot of the formal language that's developed at Young Project emerges through um, incredible insecurity about how to model. And so in looking at these 2D environments and these 2D diagrams um, in a very laborious way, there is a heightened significance to a 2D cut, to a plan and to a section. And that you could follow those things and build it up layer by layer by layer by layer by layer to generate this very unexpected three-dimensional environment um, but it's one in which the plan in the section or the uh, two-dimensional abstraction it has a heightened significance because I didn't know how to model, right? I've never taken a computer modeling class in my life. Um, but in some ways I've turned, or I think the office has turned that into um, a manner in which we can negotiate as a technique between 2D and 3D that still says within that level of abstraction through working through the cut, you can find very different three-dimensional relationships than when you're just modeling and then extracting the cut out of it. So um, what happened to us in grad school or what happened to me in grad school was, was this kind of breakthrough. And when I talk about how the thesis project is still really relevant, that's how the six square house was designed. That's how the retreat in the Dominican Republic was designed. And they're formally very divergent from each other. But it's finding at very critical moments, um, alignments, tangency, normal surfaces that are, are speculating on how those relationships at that moment have to be continuous or discontinuous. So that's my ramble that probably didn't get at what you were looking for. I think, I think this is precisely the questions uh, uh, the questions I'm sure are not meant to be completely answered because in some ways I, I don't know what I'm asking. Um, is, is, a, is a probe, and I think um, you, you just bring out probably the most architectural uh, delivery of the entire semester, uh, of the entire lecture in a way. I think, um, uh, I think from, to end my part of it um, is to just share a screen. Uh, can you allow me to share a screen? Sure. Is to, maybe is, this does, let's say, uh, bring up some similarities or some discourse, we could also end there, depends on how you're interested. So this is your uh, Lima Mali project. And then you could, 
I think there's a beautiful symmetry between how you organize your websites and even the font sizes. Um, I think, you know, how you labeled uh, buildings, objects, buildings, objects, the transcaler was still present in both of your work. I think it bleeds out in your presentation for this. Um, and just, you know, purely looking at the plan cut as, as, uh, as Brian said, there's, there's some idea of tessellation of, that happens over there. Uh, again, an observation. Uh, if you have anything to say, I'm, 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 I'm all ears. If if not, we can give the floor to uh, to our audience. Um, what do you want to? I mean, it's it's interesting. I didn't I didn't think about this, but yeah, we both we both uh, submitted for this competition. Um, I mean, do you want to? We could go through a kind of uh, comparison and contrast. Uh, and you are you are probably already bringing up some interesting parallels. I don't know if we've ever done this. Have you ever done this, Brian? Put our two websites next to each other. Uh, I've looked at your website, and I know what mine looks like. <laughs> so in that sense, I have. I haven't. I haven't done it like. I haven't done it like this. <laughs> it is uh, striking. It, but that, that 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 might just be Squarespace. Yeah, I mean that's the other thing to say <laughs> is that ultimately we're we're all. We're, we're all uh, funneling through the same templates to some level. Maybe the comment I would make is that um, we're interested in buildings, but we're interested in objects. Uh, we're interested in objects in the manner of their, their presence and their confusion. I'm interested in objects in that they're faster and easier to actually fabricate and make. So we have a series of whether you want to call them furniture pieces, that, that's one way. Um, but also Mike briefly mentioned uh, materiality. And so we have been for the last 10 years cataloging uh, multiple research projects that deal with anything from plaster to concrete to ceramic tiles to casting materials. And we are, I'm happy to announce, we have a series of tiles that are gonna be released by Palo Lenti, the Italian furniture line. And so I think maybe in my mind, the difference here is the way in which we consider objects and research um, versus I think perhaps how Mike is looking at objects. Yeah, I don't, for us, uh, we see architecture as a, a multimedia investigation. So drawings, objects, buildings, writings, those are all part of what, what we're investigating at Young and Ayata. And and we see it as being interrelated with uh, our teaching deeply. So questions of how to use and abuse image making, how to use and abuse 3D printers, how to, how to think through the technologies of representation and, and other media that we're involved with as architects. We'll work on that in the studio of Young and Ayata, and then we'll work on that in our, our teaching in studios and seminars and back and forth and in and out of each other. It's uh, it's a, it's, in a way, all of these things, drawings, objects, buildings, it's not that they all are privileged by leading towards a building, but that the building is one amongst uh, the, many, the many forms of media and mediations that we work at as architects. Um, Maybe Tin Yang click on research on my side, which I think might align more to objects on my side. In the research we're looking at, um, these material investigations that almost always involve things like mixing, baking, casting, um, intense heat, ways in which Mike says, uh, what, what, what did you just say? Disrupting? And I don't know what you, you use the word. I'm gonna say breaking a system of fabrication. So for the pole plaster panels, we looked at a traditional technique for making panels and we, and we kind of recreated that. For the palm crete, we looked at a way of casting concrete and we kind of broke that. And it's a way to think about um, loosening an approach such that there's a sense of arbitrary entropy, a lack of control in order to allow material aesthetics to emerge out of a process of form making. I think that's that's actually probably something uh, where there's a difference, there's an overlap and a difference that could be teased out in an interesting way. 
because I think that when when we're investigating things like material qualities, like if you click on the the objects that are called donkeys and feathers, or on our side, it's the the blue uh, to the left of that, yeah, that one. So, so in for us, if you kind of click through some of those, these are experiments in in three D printing. So the material is plaster, but we don't want you to see plaster at all. If you just keep clicking, continuing a bit through. We want to, through an effort of color, material, texture, ornament, decoration, articulation, relationships and misalignments between the form of the object and the articulation of the object, we want you to think it is made out of something that it is not. We want you to think it has reality in terms of its materiality. And that materiality is not the, the plaster that it's actually 3D printed out of. Um, so, so at a certain level, there's a, there's a similarity there where Brian's experimenting with making techniques of construction or techniques of material do things that they hadn't done previously. Um, but still, I think there's uh, a kind of groundedness in Brian's work where it is, it is still materially tied to the processes that those materials go through. Um, for Young and Ayata, and this might go back to your comment, Tinyan, that, that relates to um, aesthetics and, and vision, but we're actually trying to make you uh, think that it's not what it actually is. And I know that sounds like it's a little bit mean, but it's, it's more in line with, uh, I think, what architecture constantly puts into play, which is it's constantly putting us into situations where the realities of the environments that we're inhabiting are put into doubt. And we begin to think different thoughts and experience different relationships to those environments not based on them somehow being true to their materials, but by the ways in which they uh, ask us to question what is something like truth to a material. I think it's, it's very well said. Uh, going across your work, it, again, there's many, many things you can say about it, but um, I think a lot of architect brothers, not a lot of, but the, I think some architects choose to team up with their uh, either brother or even father um, in certain ways. And, and there's a kind of continuity in there. But it's interesting to see, you know, for me, this is a, this is a kind of contested symmetry uh, on my screen. Um, mm -hmm. You can see parallels, but also very creative differences uh, and stances you take. Uh, I guess it's time to yield the floor to our audience. Uh, I'm sure they have something to ask since it's, and there's a lot of material, especially offered by your uh, presentation at the very, at the very start. Uh, if you um, are not convenient to speak, I can speak for you. Uh, if you want to speak, just uh, unmute yourself. And then um, I think that would be very uh, appreciated. I would like to thank you. I'm an um, art graduate of Cooper Union, and I'm starting to restart my career after doing tons of other things. But what was fun in what you said, you mentioned the first thing you did. When I entered Cooper, I designed a hexagon beach house in the test that we took. Mm -hmm. And currently I've been fascinated by, with hexagons and wondering where did I come out with that? Uh, but in one of our final projects at Cooper, I wanted to do the Bill of Rights in um, fabric uh, patchwork embroidery, um, other fabric things. Um, I have a sewing background. And the teacher said, oh God, no, you can never do that. You'll never finish it. So I did it in carpenter tools using uh, photostats. But what I think is so interesting, as you're saying, uh, you're, I love what you said about learning from younger people. And I must say, you've all been very interesting. And um, I'm going to go back to my hexagons with a different viewpoint. In fact, I love the fact that they are in bubbles. So I'm going to give a whirl of doing a bubble hexagon. And then uh, to the students, um, it's so interesting to see. Um, I love the fact that you're talking about art, which I don't think I have experienced before, especially I went to night school. I was working in an agency, advertising agency. So we didn't really talk about the metaphysical um, 
conceptual ideas in art and i think they're so interesting right now i started to read the uh artist spirit by henry uh, um, smith may i think he was in he influenced david lynch uh so i think it's so interesting also i guess to read i'm very lucky to be able to reinvent myself uh, but uh thank you very much i really had a wonderful time you've been very yeah. just what i needed today thank you Thank you. Thank you. That's great. You know, it's it's something something you um, brought up in there that uh, we didn't touch on uh, enough is is just um, the involvement that both Brian and I have had within within art over our life. Uh, a lot of it due to our mother, who was incredibly artistic and and kind of brought this that up in us. But also, and I wanted to to kind of mention this, and so thanks for bringing it back to my mind, Dagmar. But um, for instance, Brian and I learned about Russian constructivism through Paul Peralta. Brian and I learned about Raymond Pettibone because he was the brother of Greg Ginn and started SST. Uh, we we learned a, about a lot of art movements. Every Not, Sonic Youth cover. Every Sonic Youth. I mean, this is through, uh, I mean, Gerhard Richter. The first time we, 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 we thought about Gerhard Richter was Daydream Nation album cover. This is, so I guess what I'm, what I'm bringing up by that is um, there's something, uh, I think all of us in, in every way begin to become immersed and enmeshed in aesthetic cultures, not necessarily through classrooms, but through our kinds of involvements with, uh, with you know, the kinds of passions that we experience in our in our day-to-day -day life. And when those things kind of come together and, and, and resonate in different ways, I think it's important for us uh, as as architects to kind of acknowledge and, and sort of understand that 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 is part of what architecture brings to the world. It's it's part of its possibilities is is uh, opening up alternate aesthetic experiences, not by enforcing some kind of um, let's say necessary theory, uh, but to to say that yeah, that all of this skateboarding, music, uh, textiles. Uh, quilting, uh, graphic design posters, it's all kind of uh, cooking our environment and, and it's kind of making people think things and do things in different ways. Lovely. Any more questions or comments? Yeah, um, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Hi, Michael and Brian. Michael, it's good to see you again. Hi. Uh, thank you both for your talk. It's been um, great to see uh, your influences of your upbringing and your professional work. Um, I was wondering if you have ever cross-pollinated your, um, your, in, your inspirations or your practices, either like in collaboration or in just inspiration and influence. Um, it's been great to see how you two have like diverged in your work, but uh, I'm wondering if you guys have ever converged at all or if that's a possibility for the future. Um, Ting Yang, can you click back on the websites? I don't know if that's possible. Or I'll just try to describe it. I'll give you an example. Um, my Young Projects has been doing this material research. This is a good place for a long time. And it's interesting that Mike described in his vessels how um, he doesn't want you to know that that's plaster, uh, but I can distinctly remember driving to New Jersey to go to our accountant that we shared when we used to do this little pilgrimage once a year. And Mike saying to me something like, in the pulled plaster, hey, go, go back. Um, in the pulled, one? yeah, go back. No, 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 that, no, we don't want that one. In the pulled <laughs> plaster, in the cast aluminum, in the palm crete, and the cement tiles, that in, in a lot of these projects, we were similarly subverting, I think, uh, the legibility of what the material actually is. And I maybe I'm doing that more explicitly through, through making um, in the sense that this, this reads as plaster, but the way it achieves its unique softness, its patterning, its texture and geometry is through a technique that artisans use. Um, but I can say that that comment from Mike saying that 
unlike maybe the pantheon of modernism in which you have board form concrete in which the wood that is used for the formwork and is encoded within the concrete surface or seeing steel ties in concrete or seeing like very articulated joints that so clearly articulate what you're trying to see from a tectonic perspective um, has absolutely inspired the way we think about materiality with the explicit intention of trying to create a little bit of ambiguity relative to what the material is through the process that it's making. It may not be that you look at this and you think, oh, that's not concrete, but it's a concrete that's behaving in a way in terms of its geometry and in terms of its texture that's a little bit different. This, for example, is a, a cast concrete wall in the Dominican Republic that's a 70 foot span with no concrete ties where we cast into the palms of uh, fallen palm leaves on the site. And so the material investigations that we've taken on very much relate to comments that Mike has made to us. Um, and, but I find it striking that, for example, Mike is looking at uh, similarly generating a kind of confusion or ambiguity of what the material is, but he's coming at it through a very different methodology in which through 3D printing, through color, through articulation, it's disguised. Whereas in our work, it's coming out of um, the actual prototyping of these pieces. Yeah, I think that's true. But to Elena's question, we did do one project together. Yes, we did do that. <laughs> you can um, put it up. Yeah, that your the, the, the hive, that hive. Yeah, yeah we did that earlier. Oh, why is it on your website now? Then? <laughs> it's on both our websites. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh, it's under, I just under objects. Ah. Uh, right. So how did this work? This was there was an idea that that there would be an alien lighter, yeah. alien insect hive that would yeah, come, yeah. would be on a roof in yeah, Tribeca. Yeah. And yeah, you'd come, alien insects. You'd, yeah. You'd you'd come out and you'd see this. And, and now there's a um a, uh, a a beech tree that has started to kind of grow around this a little bit. And and ideally, just for a moment, you could look at this hive and say, what what insect is growing in that hive. Um, that was the conceptual conceit. In terms of execution, I think the geometry in part came from looking at a kind of wilted leaf in the Dominican Republic. Um, in terms of the execution, of course, Mike modeled the geometry. Um, <laughs> I would not have been able to do that. But it was a, it was a great project. It was. It was, and it's, uh, it's. I mean, at a certain level too, it's of its time. I mean, 2010, that's 11 years ago. It, it's interesting. I mean, this is the, the thing that, I mean, we could talk about as well because we are talking about spans of time, but um, it's also interesting how our offices have changed over the past decade and just what we've been interested in and how those things have, you can always find the through lines that run through the entirety of, of the work, but um, mutating and this is definitely a project of its moment in 2010. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, for, like, what, what is this made of? Because you have a you have a cardboard model. Sorry, not cardboard. You have a corrugated cardboard model. But then, the, how it's is a, this achieved? It's a 3D print that then was nickel plated. Yeah. Oh, that that was it was there ten years ago. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's pretty big too. It's a pretty big 3D print. This is not <laughs> cheap. This is not a cheap light fixture. <laughs> How many of those? Two. Two. <laughs> you're looking at. You're looking at them. I see. Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it. But this is very much an anomaly, I think, within the work of young projects in the sense that the, the nature of the cells, the way they kind of aggregate. In the other material research that we've done, those kinds of qualities we're looking to have um, emerge through the formation and the making itself, rather than as a, a kind of layer that we put on top of the material. 
But it, there's something uh, I'm, I'm happy you brought up the the alien uh, insects. But I, I do think that with all of our projects, both Young and Ayata and, and Young projects, in, in slightly different manners, uh, the work always kind of has with it sort of strange counterfactual scenarios of, of the ways in which we're speaking about it. It's even projects that are done for clients, there's, there's a sort of way of, of understanding it and a narrative to it that is addressed to the kind of specifics of the brief and the site and the context and the client. But I think there's also with both Brian and I, and I think this has something to do with like, whatever, the, the weird worlds of film and, and, and music and other sorts of uh, games we grew up playing. Um, we're kind of building up sort of speculative worlds. They all all have sort of other narratives that we that we sp speak about with our uh, with our offices with each other. And um, so, even though this ostensibly is a project about testing the limits of three D printing and uh, grasshopper in terms of its manipulation of cellular uh, structures for variation, they're all hexagons. Back to an earlier question. Ultimately, we're not care. We don't really care about that. We care about do people look at it and start to think about um, alien hives? Do people look at it and start to wonder what made that? How did that get made? What kind of world is it that makes things like that? Uh, I think those are questions that we're, we're more interested in. Well, it was also made with the intent that there's going to be a camera out there. And I yeah. know that at one point we did an animation and there was a little gelatinous insect that was um, occupying the hive that then was meant to change shape color based upon fluctuations in the stock market or Yankee box scores. And uh -huh. just, just today, Meredith Cole, who's the, was our first employee said, I've been thinking about NFTs and your hive B video. That's a perfect F in NFT and you should do it. Um, so maybe there will be another, and, and, it would be, yeah, and it would be jacked into the security camera footage. So the security yeah. camera footage would show the hive most of the time just straight up normal. But then sometimes you'd be walking by it and look over and there'd be this thing that came out of it, right? Yeah. I mean, there, right. David Lynch is fairly deep within all of this as well. Um, it, it, you know, there, we didn't even talk about it, the movies that we, were, we watched as kids. There's, there's a and whole nother lips. Yeah, absolutely. Any more questions? Um, yeah, I, uh, so I have Professor Young and Professor Young this semester at the same time. Um, I think I'm the only person from my year here right now because the rest of them are um, in a class, but it's just been really interesting to see uh, the, sh the commonalities in uh, sort of experience. I'm almost suspicious of it in a way. Uh, the idea that you both have a, a sort of shared experience that has led to your design practices, which are actually pretty different in a lot of ways. Um, so I guess my question is sort of, or maybe it's two parts. Uh, I guess the, I, I want to hear both of you sort of talk about your your thoughts on the the translation or the movement from the west coast to the east coast and uh sort of like the the suitcase that you pack with all the experiences you guys were talking about and what you think that you learned from your your days before designing that um might differ between you two and also maybe I guess the question of I mean you are bro brothers after all so uh any significant kind of argument that or arguments that you two have had that um that might uh be insightful to the differences between your practices thanks Yeah, that's a good question, Andrew. Thank you. And, and uh, you know, that uh, speaks a little bit to Brian's point that some of the connections between our work, um, I think, are, are fairly deep and fairly, uh, at, a, at a one level, we share genes and, and parents and, and lived together for the first 18 years of our lives in, in specific environments. But um, 
some of the connections are, are, are more speculations on a current sort of conversation about how we see the work that we're doing now and how we can see it in relationship to each other. So the, so the differences are, I think, important to also maybe identify. Um, so I don't, I don't know, what do you think, Brian? I mean, at one level, uh, we both came in the early 2000s from West Coast to East Coast. We both came to go to graduate school. I do think there's a difference between the GSD and Princeton. And I do think that actually that difference uh, is still kind of in, in a way resonant in the way we speak, words we use, arguments that we uh, are interested in or ways of forming arguments that we're interested in. So there could be a conversation about the differences between the GSD and Princeton in the early 2000s. Um, but there, there are some other differences that maybe we can tease out just about the ways in which we approach practices or having an office or teaching even too, if we wanted to get into that. I mean, what, do you, what do you think, Brian? What do you see as some of the differences? Um, I mean, I guess for me, going to the GSD and for example, I had Preston Scott Cohen's first option studio and it completely changed the way in which I thought about form. Um, the question came up before about Peter Eisenman and Rim Kulhas, and I could have, I would have absolutely, my first year at the GSD said Rim Kulhas, as I thought much more about urbanism and about program and about juxtaposition. And by the time I was graduating, I was thinking much more about form and geometry. Um, it, look, I don't know, there's a lot of differences and a lot of similarities. Yesterday, when we were looking at this and you broke down your thesis project, um, analyzing Borromini, I said to you, I can't believe how similar our thesis projects are. And I said that because you were devising a technique in which you could layer by layer by layer by layer by layer, use geometry in a new way to begin to decode what's actually happening within that building, within that cathedral in the dome. And that's exactly the methodology that was deployed for understanding Pac-Man. I'm not saying Pac-Man and Borromini are the same, but in Pac-Man, I had to wrap it in a cylinder. I had to offset it and stratify it into multiple layers. And then I had to go painstakingly layer by layer by layer by layer and layer to extrude them in order to construct this environment. So um, without a doubt, Michael has always come at this from a way in which he can extend ideas of history and theory and philosophy into uh, a way that it informs his work and probably much more rigorously and truthfully extended techniques of mathematics and geometry as, uh, as the center of his project. I don't know if that's a Princeton thing. I think that's a Mike Young thing. Um, for me, it has been, these are things that I found interesting, funny, and inspiring, and how can I, with my limited knowledge and techniques, turn them into something I haven't seen before? I don't think that's a specifically GSD thing. That's just how I'm doing stuff. So I don't think we're answering your question, Andrew. Um, I do, I can say absolutely, having worked in San Francisco for three years and having had multiple professors at Berkeley that came from the GSD, that that's where I wanted to go to school. And I went there and it kicked my butt and I wasn't ready for it. And it completely changed the way I thought about architecture and informed the next 20 years of uh, my life up until now. Um, yeah, I was also gonna say, and this is maybe for a longer discussion, but it's maybe interesting to think about. Everything that Kutan and I do in our practice is at some level tied to seminars and, and studios we teach. Um, and the seminars and studios we teach are often geared to, to begin to ask questions that we may explore in future practice work. So um, part of the experiments that we're doing are, are literally me trying to figure out how to teach something, how to teach a, an idea, how to teach a, a concept, how to teach a technique, how to teach a, an approach. And, and I don't know if that's, that's, I'm assuming that's not the same for young projects, Brian. So maybe. Um, it's not maybe. the same, but the, I mean, Andrew started this question and Andrew just went through a process of creating a material morsel that then was uh, aggregated into what we call the loose lattice that then led into creating a diorama. And 
Um, I've taught that now three or four times, and it's very much engaged in the manner in which we look at form finding material properties that emerge through boiling, melting, combining different hybrid materials, applying uh, actions to a material in order to see how they'll deform and change. And that's, that's a big part of what we do in our research into prototyping. Yeah. Um, and so I think about that all the time. Yeah. So I think there's, so maybe there's a connection there. Um, okay. Uh, there's somebody has their hand raised. I see, I can see, and I'm sure there's some other, some other questions. Uh, let's see. Can you hear me? Yeah. So my question was uh, originally going back to the Eisenman Rem Cool House, but you kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to take Eisenman versus Christopher Alexander as a starting point for a conversation between you guys. Um, if you're familiar with the Harvard uh, like um, conference where Eisenman and Alexander went back and forth about form, I basically felt like Eisenman was arguing like, well, what I like is these ugly columns because they make you feel sick. Um, and I felt like Alexander is saying like, no, it's our responsibility as architects to make people feel whole. And so that was my starting point to a question to you guys. Uh, that's it. It's, thank you for the question because uh, first of all, that sort of debate between um, Peter Eisenman and, and Christopher Alexander is, is an interesting one. And that at some sort of point in, in our spot where we are now, we see them both as kind of interested in, in systematicity of uh, different processes and procedures. And in a way their argument feels very foreign to, to maybe the ways in which we would argue about I don't know, contemporary architecture. And I know Brian's brought up geometry quite a bit. I, d I don't really actually talk that much about geometry in either studios or in, in the office. It's almost like a kind of given that it's a part of the internal operations of what we do. Uh, but what I like about the way you, you phrased your question, Justin, is you framed it in terms of aesthetics. And this is probably something that both Peter and, and, and Christopher Alexander at that moment would have been very uncomfortable talking about. And, and that's, I think that's, I'd never heard it exactly phrased the way you just phrased it uh, as, as one being interested in the ugliness of a column and the other being interested in some sort of sense of, of creating a whole. I'm gonna have to think about that because usually uh, when I've thought about the differences between the two, I've thought about them more so in the framework of Peter's uh, dissertation, the, the kind of uh, notes on a formal, uh, architecture and no, Christopher Alexander's is the notes, uh, Peter's is the, what's the title of Peter's PhD? Do you have it on the tip of your tongue? No. No, uh, but that's how, I, that's how I think of that debate going back into the 1960s uh, of one being more tied to the systematicity of computation another being more tied to systems of formal analysis and the ways in which a set of uh, architects in that case for Peter Tarogny, Frank Lloyd Wright, Alvar Aalto, and Le Corbusier uh, would, would break with and establish new, uh, new procedures through formal systems as opposed to finding the um, appropriate indoor balanced system of operations which uh, could be more associated with uh, Alexander. Um, I'm going to have to think about it because I haven't thought about this uh, aesthetic question. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not familiar enough with the the actual wording of the argument, but uh, I'm going to think about it. It's a good question. I would have said exactly what Michael said word for word. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something, there is something a little bit, I mean, I started, uh, I do have serious questions about that, but I didn't start thinking about it from the perspective of uh, post-punk, and it's like, a lot of that music is also, it's not like trying to be a symphony, you know, it's like, it has something else to convey. Um, and and I, I sort of think of Eisenman in this context of like a scientist who's just like, I'm interested in whatever, like I feed someone this, their leg goes numb. I feed something this, their stomach goes sick. Like 
Ooh, interesting. Like all these variations. It's like he has actually no care for or concern for how a regular person experiences it or whatever. This is my obviously take on it. And it's like, Alexander's like, well, no, I want to feed him like a nice like meal. And you can argue about whether Alexander's successful of that in his own work, but his, the whole, how he talks about his work is definitely about like, that's what I want to do is make sure that uh, people are, are nourished in that way. But it's like, yeah, I mean, that's the, okay, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Michael. Hi, Brian. Hi. How are you doing? I have a question. I feel a little bit like I'm crashing a party uh, because I'm not, because uh, I'm a Pratt, um, Pratt student. But uh, thank you for the fascinating discussion. Um, both of you have touched a little bit upon how, well, we, you've talked a lot about how your lives together um, and, and the world around you has influenced the way you see architecture and the way you practice architecture. Um, but I think it's, I, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about um, how those experiences have helped you to express architecture back to the world, which obviously is a really important part of even being able to thrive as an architect in order to be able to um, operate as an architect to even put your work out into the world to have that kind of privilege if you like so um how how would you compare and contrast your attitudes towards expressing the architecture in a, in a way that is meaningful to to the to the world outside of architecture i mean so i think it's a really good question and i think it's relevant to shifting um, ideas within my studio now. Um, there have been a lot of uh, building projects that have been primarily residential. And in those projects, they've afforded a certain, um, I'm the luckiest architect of all time, but these experiments into materiality in which we can speculate on uh, hybrid materials, material aesthetics that are, are a little bit foreign as ways in which you can draw people into an architectural proposition through this sense of the uncanny, through the sense of not necessarily knowing what it is you're looking at. And that's an idea about spatial ambiguity. I say there's a second idea that is more about um, or that's material ambiguity. The second idea about spatial, spatial oscillations. And we have several projects in which the manner in which um, a spatial party begins to subvert itself as you begin to engage it, such that you're able to read a space in a very different way than you had maybe initially. And so both of these, uh, I think, indicate an idea about spatial narratives. So within our work, there is a desire to engage users by beginning to, um, in subtle ways sometimes and in more uh, distinct ways, change the manner in which they understand the architecture that they're engaging. And that that's fundamental to creating um, something that allows a user to look, see, act, interact with other people a little bit differently. Um, and a lot of the new projects that we have, the scale and the programs are jumping. So we're doing a community center in the Dominican Republic, um, a housing project in Colorado that has 120 units. We're gonna potentially be doing some pop-up retail work that's experimenting with different materiality. And so I think we wanna take a lot of the same ideas that are about engaging users in ways in which it will promote interaction and, and pr promote precisely because we create these kind of unexpected environments, but do it in a way in which we're thinking more directly about sustainability and putting that at the forefront of the conversation and more directly about kind of community involvement and how people live together, which is a, a really exciting shift to move from uh, primarily residential work to hopefully community-based work and in, in uh, institutional work as well. And I just say, um, 
architecture is in the background. Uh, it's in the background of our everyday lives. And so what we do as architects is we adjust that background um, and propose it to be other than, than we assume it to be. And, and if we can do that as architects, if we can, if we can um, alter its possibilities for the ways in which it appears and behaves, then maybe we can understand different ways that we can share this environment with each other. And, and so that's what I see the, the project actually of, of architecture to be in its most, um, in its most sort of uh, general way in terms of how it relates to the politics of the world. Um, and I, I just got to note that uh, uh, Yang's connection is unstable and that we're uh, supposed to be wrapping up here pretty soon or pretty shortly. But um, I guess maybe is, is there one question that somebody has out there that we want to use as a last question or I don't know if Tin Yang wants to ask the last question or, or how we want to exactly wrap it up. Um, hi, uh, Michael and Brian, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, um, I just love uh, your work and seeing how it all wrapped up. I, what I love about architecture is how like we can just create something and then see it come to life. And um, I recently saw um, architect Mark Foster Gage's work and I saw about how um, in, in, New York, in New York, where he designed a like a gothic, um, a gothic project, a, a gothic project that focused more on on detail and like I believe it was like stone masonry, and I I I just think it, how interesting how like we kind of departed from uh, like less ornate structures into more like simplified and more. Uh, more modernized structures and there's kind of like a stigma behind it how people started hating <laughs> uh, modernized architecture because it kind of like it withdrew, withdrew away from that more classical more neoclassical style that we've seen uh, before the before the turn of the 20th century and I just want to know like do you think that like what is the future of architecture do you think that it serves the purpose of Art, or do you think it serves the purpose of function and that it will pay more attention to practicality? Well, it's uh, thank you for the question. And, uh, and yeah, absolutely. There's, there's things and shifts and changes that have happened over the last hundred years. And, and some of the points you bring up are, are interesting points about how do we understand the appearance and, and of uh, modern architecture of contemporary architecture. I, I for one, don't pit the two against each other, the, yeah. the ornamental or the functional. Um, I, I see them as continually working in and out of, uh, in and out of each other, and that they all kind of come together within the, the question of aesthetics. And so for, for Young and Ayata, it's, it's quite often this question of aesthetics and the aesthetics of realism particularly, which is a much longer, much more involved uh, question, I know. Um, I don't know, Brian, do you have something you wanna? Yeah, I don't see them pitted against each other at all. And if you look at the work of Young Projects, I think you could see moments in which something is, you know, the quintessential modernist party of a, a cantilevered plane that is there to provide solar shading. And then you can look at something like that plaster ceiling that you put in place that it is really about ornamentation, but it's about a kind of confusion as well. Um, ornamentation in a very different way. So I think these suggested oppositions are uh, not oppositional and they work together. Um, I think we're at an exciting moment precisely because I, I feel like less so that these are boundaries by which architects need to associate themselves. I think if anything, I feel less pressure to um, answer questions like, is it eyes and men or rim? I feel less pressure to be part of a certain camp and more um, the capability of kind of engaging a wider body of uh, potential ideas, aesthetics, spatiality, um, and so that's tremendously exciting. And I think it all needs to be done in a lens that's in incorporating ideas of sustainability and social justice. And um, those are going to become, at least for young projects and are becoming for young projects, an increased uh, 
heightened development in what we're doing. You know, it's, it's interesting um, looking here at all the names and it's kind of a great collection of, of uh, people who are here uh, today. And thank you all for coming. I mean, look, um, we got a, a Emmanuel Osorono who, who worked with us on the still life and on the objects. We have uh, Mallory Schur, who I worked with in, in San Francisco in the end of the 90s and who's now working with Brian at Young Projects. Karen Lang, who was my thesis advisor at Cal Poly. Um, Kudanayata, my partner. Uh, uh, Nor, who worked for both Young uh, Projects and Young and Ayata. I'm kind of calling everybody out. I know I'm, I don't mean to be calling you out, but our mother's here, our wives are here, our, our kids are here, and uh, that's just cool. It's just oh, and, my uh, sister in law's here in from France. Yeah. Hi, hi, Ingrid. Awesome. All right. Sorry. And, and so. <laughs> yeah, so it's not, uh, and, and I think that we've been kind of told we have to wrap up because there's things that are about to happen here in, in a few minutes. So even though there's a great question about urbanism that I think both Brian and I would want to say something about, uh, I think we kind of have to uh, call it a day for today. And uh, there's some interesting things that the questions have raised that I think Brian and I are going to be thinking about for quite a bit. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, but thank you, everybody, for coming. And, and as Brian, it's been kind of great to do this. It's the first time we've ever publicly talked about each other's work, and and so it's 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 been interesting. It's been kind of uh, yeah. There's Melissa Shin. Melissa Shin was a student of mine. Uh, worked with me. Like there's everybody. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks everyone. everyone.